Hey, Chris Manning here from the Locked On Cavs podcast, your daily look at the Cleveland Cavaliers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Michelob Ultra. At only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories, it's only worth it if you enjoy it. Stay tuned for the Ultra Player of the Week coming up later in this episode of Locked On Cavs. Joined, as always, here on the pod with my buddy, my co-host, Evan Damerel. Evan, how you doing? Pretty good. Uh, I miss the 80 degree weather and somewhat blus- like Kanye West would say the weather's so breezy, man. Why can't life always be this easy? I feel that way about today's weather. It was a torrential downpour in the low fifties, upper forties. And uh, it's just a bummer. How are you doing good? I just want to salute the folks that are vo- a lot of the national guard folks at the Wilson center that are volunteering to, uh, vaccinate uh, Ohioans and Clevelanders and salute to them. I got my second dose. It's very easy. If you haven't done it, go to the, the registration website and, and do it. It's simple, easy, direct. And thanks to them for taking their time and, and doing yeah. their part to help us kind of get through this. Salute to, to those folks. They're all extremely nice. Yeah. Um, uh, my girlfriend is getting her vaccine Friday at the Wolstein. She got her first dose, obviously, three weeks ago. Pfizer gang, what up? But um, no, they're super easy, super streamlined process. Super impressed because I dropped her off for it, and it was a lot of people going in, and I was surprised she was able to get in and out in the a lot about twenty minutes or so with the fifteen minute rest time. So yeah, shouts to them. Thanks for all they do. Yeah. All right. So let's dive into the show uh, today. We're going to cover Darius Garland's recent play and his Player of the Week nomination. We are going to cover upcoming games this week for the Cavs to play Charlotte and to play Golden State, and we're going to talk through um, the rest of the season and sort of the schedule and the playoff hopes. We're going to give you maybe start doing some schedule updates and scanning updates more accurately once a week. I think just to dive into them is probably just good, you know, good content fodder for us, but also um, I think informative audio or video for watching us on, on WKYC. But Evan, let's start with Darius Garland. So I just want to point out what his uh, last four games have been because they've been pretty freaking good. Yeah, just a bit. Uh, and I think that's last week. I might be wrong. I'll double check that and redo the parameters if I mess that up. But four games. Here's Darius's numbers. 34 minutes a game, shooting 53.2% from the field, 46.4% from three on seven attempts per game, which is well above his season average. He's averaging seven assists a game against just 2.5 turnovers. Um, and he's averaging ultimately 22.3 points per game. Um, Cleveland, he's, he's looked really, really good. Um, basically over this last stretch, I think Darius is really finding a lot that is working for him at the moment. And I, I haven't, I just come away really, really impressed And this. That four game sample should, uh, is so that would be Monday. The Spurs includes the Spurs game where he had his career high 37, the Oklahoma city game, the Toronto game where they got shellacked and he had an injury and the Pelicans game where they led for most, much of the game, and then they lost um, on Sunday. So that that is those four games. He's been really great. And Evan, I think, like I, I think we still need to see how he finishes the year and everything. But like, I don't think how you, if you're going to look at this season and look at him, and maybe it's colored a little bit by this recent stretch of play. But I, I cannot look at this season and not think that Darius Garland has proven himself in a way he certainly did not as a rookie last season. No, I absolutely agree. And this is something you and I have been talking about for a while. That's why we gave him a did not complete grade. If we actually had to attach a letter grade to player seasons last year and um, Darius, like I talk about shows flashes of potential. And I think we're finally starting to see him capitalize it. Like a lot of it does come from the San Antonio game. Like he was just absolutely bonkers in that one. But like I said, after that game, yeah, he was phenomenal scoring, but even more impressive the fact that he still was moving the rock and keeping the rest of his teammates involved. Like it was a bit of a team effort against a respectable San Antonio team. And like he's just looked really sharp over the last week. And we might be tipping our hat a little bit on our Michelob Ultra player of the week here. But no, Darius has been super impressive. And like you said, yeah, we need to see a little bit more of it and how he finishes down the stretch. But I think I'm starting to get the vibe and understanding on why Cleveland picked him fifth overall. I know they were big DeAndre Hunter fans in that front office during that draft, but Darius was a a pretty close competitor as well in terms of just having favorites in the organization as well. And no, Darius has been great. Um, as long as he can stay healthy, knock on wood and hope for the best here. That's his biggest bugaboo with his career is like him being consistent because of him his inability to stay healthy. So hopefully it stays that way, and hopefully we get to see more of uh, what's to come with him. 
Yeah, so I want to I want to point out one thing that I think is particularly notable about this last week, um, these last stretch of games for him, and sort of an illustrative point I think of where things are unlocking for him if this if this sort of trend or a little thing to note here continues. So it's just it's just the three point volume he's taking. So I'm going to give you some some numbers as I'm prone to do here on the show. Uh, <laughs> three point attempts per game last season, five per game. He's actually taking less this year at four point six per game. As I noted, he's taking seven per game over this last four games. What is interesting is if you go into his his like terms of his, how many shots he's taking, frequency versus accuracy, he's in the bottom about forty percent of guards according to Cleaning the Glass. But then if you go to accuracy among among point guards only, he's in the top. He's like close to the ninetieth percentile at forty one percent from three on the year. Um, he's at forty percent on non corner three pointers, which is about at that eightieth percentile of point guards. That's a really really good sign. And look, I think one of the ways you unlock Darius. And I think one of the ways you can unlock him and unlock, you know, him with Colin, him with basically anybody is, is he, is he going to launch? Is he going to take volume threes? I think he took 10 against San Antonio. I don't know if he's going to take 10 a game. I don't know if that's like in his DNA. I I mean, I think if you look at his, the sample we've seen from him so far, like he's definitely not a guy who's going to just bomb, 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 bomb. He doesn't have like that Kobe white kind of scoring vibe to him. And if you're going to compare him to another young guard, but He's got I the ability to Kobe be really White potent. There's more to Colin Sexton, to be fair. Well, but continue. Right. But I'm saying like he doesn't have yeah. that like I'm just gonna hunt shot on. He's gonna set up guys, and I think he understands how important that is for his role on this team. I think at times you want to see him be a little bit more selfish, but I, I think he's really blossomed as a shooter, and I want to see where this goes because I think if you're gonna tell me he can actually start taking deeper three pointers, and he's taking like a good number of them in that 24 to 26 range, like two to four feet behind the three point line, it's not a it's not an insignificant number at that range. No, like that's gonna stretch everything out for the Cavs offense, and when you're gonna play Jared Allen. Um, when teams, you know, might ignore Isaac Okoro, that is going to matter for the offense functioning. Because, like, theoretically, next year you could go into this year with the same starting five that you might see at the end of the season: Sexland, Okoro, Kevin Love, and Jared Allen. And if that's the case, Okoro is going to be a guy that teams are going to slag off on. Yep. Sexton is I, teams are going to go under on pick and rolls with him. I think unless something changes, it's just the way they're defending him. Um, Jared Allen is not a spacer. Darius can stretch everything out if this kind of continues for him. Yeah, no, Darius really is the X factor in this offense, and it's cliche, but the head of the snake of an offense in the NBA really starts and begins at the point guard, and like LeBron plays point guard for the Lakers, that kind of situation too. Like the guy who is initiating the offense is the key figure here, and Darius is that key figure for the Cavs. And before we kind of jump out of here, I am curious to think, like I know Isaac Okoro has had a very impressive rookie season, but let's say the Cavs get like a shooting wing who has a more reliable three-point shot. Would you be in favor of, possibly benching a coral and rocking a lineup that features sex land, a reliable three point shooting three Kevin love and Jared Allen, just to see you have four out at least. And I know Jared can hit threes, but that's obviously not a huge feature of his game. Well, we got, we got to see, we got, we, 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 we got to see him do it for like a long stretch of time. Yeah. I know the guys at ESPN, when they did their 25 under 25, they said Jared has the ability to shoot threes. And I kind of raised an eyebrow at that. And I'm like, yeah, he's taken a few in Cleveland and I'm, not that many compared to his time in Brooklyn, but I don't know. It's just an interesting thought exercise. Like do the Cavs want to try and go four out with a traditional five or not a traditional five, but in a sense, a traditional five in Jared Allen, or do they want to stick with what they have because of the defensive potential and like the coverage is Okoro brings because defensively the sex land tandem is still flawed. So you still need somebody to kind of cover them on the perimeter a bit. It'll, I think whatever they do, I don't really know. I think Okor's defense is so good that I'm really, cons- I'd, I'd really be concerned about giving that up. And and I and I'm gonna, I'm pulling it up here to kind of see how he's doing. He's only shooting thirty, um, you know, he's only shooting, uh, thirty percent on the year on catch and shoot attempts on like on on like two and a half attempts per game. That's not yeah. great. Um, that is at in the in the last in April alone, it's at thirty two point six. So that's like a little bit better, but that's still like eh, I don't know about that. Um, you know, he's obviously had some games where he's really shot it well. If you take it back to March, um, in that range, it's like at 33%. So like he, there's times where he shot it well, right? Like there's times yeah. where you feel good about it, but it's very inconsistent. And if he, he bumps it up and it becomes a real part of his arsenal, then like, I think it becomes harder to do, but I, there will be some discussion, you know, they'll probably play it down publicly as, as I, you know, obviously probably want to do to avoid some sort of conflict. But if you're, you're, if you're a fan out there thinking about this, you're kidding themselves that Cleveland is not going to run every scenario that what is the best way for us to be the best starting five next year 
they're going to figure they're going to decide something like i don't know yep. if they're in a position where like everything is locked in that could be a cora that could be garland that could be sexton that could be kevin love gets moved and they start a court maybe a cora plays like as a cutting kind of dunker spot four and or whatever like i don't think that's like a likely option but like let's say they get cade yeah. like you, you, you're gonna make a spot you're, you're gonna make a spot for that guy right like you're gonna find a spot for him in the starting lineup it's a little different if you get Jalen green if you get moses moody whomever um but you're you're gonna have discussions there this is what teams do it's part of the evaluation process but yeah I, it's a, that question you asked is something teams are gonna break up evan before we go to the, our break and, and pay some bills here I, do you have a take on if the Dean Wade Kevin Love duo with Garland has helped in a meaningful way? Is there yeah. is there do you have any concern about about uh, Allen coming back perhaps as soon as Wednesday? Uh, I think there's going to be a little clunky. It's going to be a little awkward at first, just because Jarrett does not have as much familiarity with Kevin. And I don't think they play together at all, actually. So I think gonna... they have like one game. I'm going to look this up, but I, I, if they have, it's been like a very brief amount of time, but I it's think a, they have. That's the case with most players on Cleveland's roster this year is they have limited experience with Kevin Love so far or just over since LeBron has left town. But obviously, I think it works in small bursts. I, Dean waited the three. I know people were kind of saying like maybe he's a combo three, four with the stretchy ability and defense. No, he's absolutely not. He's way too – he does have quicker feet than I thought, but I think his feet aren't quick enough laterally to be a <laughs> – Full time three, just let's, being yeah. Fire, let's fair let's have him defend LeBron. Let's have him defend like a th- a real three for a game and see like yeah. See how that like goes let's and let's throw Jason not Tatum, go well. Jalen Brown, shit, Kevin Dur- shoot, sorry, Kevin Durant, LeBron James. Like throw an actual three at Dean Wade. And Dean Wade's probably gonna get cooked alive. But Dean, it's been a fun discovery that the Cavs can kind of play like a five out ish lineup like that, where like Isaac Okoro is technically the worst shooter on the floor, and Isaac Okoro has been shooting the ball well lately. So I think it's. It's a tandem that works, but you would obviously stick with Allen and love to start things. And then if the Cavs kind of fall behind and they need to go with a bombs away offense, at least it's a wrinkle and an option in JB Bickerstaff's back pocket. Like JB's a coach that explores things and he tries things out. And if it doesn't work, he moves on from it. But if it works, he keeps trying it. That's how we saw the all big lineup and as much Chris dislikes it. And like we saw a little bit of it too with like Dean starting at the three and then Kevin at the four and Hartenstein at the five. Like, on paper it doesn't make sense, but it worked for a little bit. So maybe in weird scenarios you can do that too. And maybe if they get a Cade, maybe if they take Jalen Suggs next year, the Cavs can explore some small ball lineups too, which are also intriguing to me as well. Uh, I was wrong. Love and Allen, according to the Clean Glass, had not played any lineups together. So Maya Copa, I was wrong. Can't wait to see them play together. Kevin's going to love know, playing with Jared Allen. I think. for real. But you know what else we love? Michelob Ultra, Chris. And you know who our Michelob Ultra Player of the Week is? Well, did we? I mean, I think we had two candidates. Yeah, it's either Dean Wade or it's Darius Garland. I think at this point, shouts to Isaac Okoro. He's been playing really well too. But let's give a little love. We just gave a whole segment to Darius Garland. Let's give a little bit of love to number thirty-two, Kevin Love Jr. Baby Kevin Love, Mennonite Kevin Love, because of the beard. I don't know what you want to call him, but Dean Wade is our Michelob Ultra Player of the Week at Locked On Cavs. Yeah, look, he just scored a career high in points. He's shooting the hell out of it from three. He is bombing away from three and just willing to take a bunch of shots and get those up. He's competing on defense, making good rotations. If you're looking at what makes the Michelob Ultra great, it is something that could bring you joy, happiness, and enjoyment when enjoyed responsibly. Dean Wade has been that guy for Cleveland. I mean, they got this is a guy they got as an undrafted player out of Kansas State, and he's become someone I think they should consider keeping around going forward and figuring out how to use him because I think he's proving to be a useful NBA frontcourt player, and he's been a fun little spark on this team in a lot of ways. And much like um, Michelob Ultra, Dean Wade comes at a reasonable price for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Also, just a reminder that uh, it's only worth it if you enjoy it. Michael Ultra is only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. Joy creates success. Enjoyment is the end game. It's the whole game. And uh, Dean Wade's been a lot of fun to watch, and that's why he's the Michael Ultra Player of the Week. Also want to tell everyone about the Locked On Today podcast. Get all the sports news you need in under 20 minutes with the Locked On Today podcast. Host Peter Burkowski updates you on the latest news in every major sport with the help of our local experts. Follow the Locked On Today podcast on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Evan, um, let me ask you, I'm going to ask you a question here uh-huh. just as a, as a way to preview these upcoming two games. So we think Jared Allen, um, it seemed Larry Nance had that back soon tweet. Um, so maybe they're both back. You're going to trim the, the the fat of the rotation when those guys come back. It's it's going to happen, right? Like you're going to play Jared Allen, you're going to play Larry Nance. 
Mm-hmm. But um, if you're looking at who's maybe the fourth big that you go to first, and maybe this is matchup dependent, maybe you want to throw a swerve and it's Lamar Stevens or whatever. But if I had to tell you, you could, you're only going to play one because you're going to play Larry, Jarrett, and Kevin the bulk of your front court minutes. Do you go Isaiah Hartenstein or do you go Dean Wade? This is tough. Well, if you want to celebrate the return of Jared Allen, buy it for Ohio shirt. I tweeted the link today, but we'll include it in the show notes as well. But um, yeah, this is tough because both players, Dean Wade and Isaiah Hartenstein, um, AKA Tower Kraut, working on that t shirt deal, folks. But um, just self promo time with Evan as I sit just to consider because Hartenstein's been a little bit of a weird surprise. He has a little bit of a playmaking side to him. I think maybe he picked that up practicing with Jokic. I don't know. Maybe he's always had it, um, but he's so foul prone and has such a propensity for fouling that maybe you could just play both if you're trying to lean on Hartenstein. But I think your matchup point is a good point. I kind of talked about this in the last segment too. Let's say the Cavs want to go five out and they play love and way together with a Coral Garland and Sexton and Coral is the worst shooter. Like that's an option. But if I had to pick like on a game to game basis, I'd probably pick Dean Wade just because Hartenstein has a propensity to foul. And I think Dean Wade can play a small ball five and burst behind Jared Allen. And then you can also plug Kevin in that spot too. And Kevin has a little bit more girth to play the five. Um, and that's granted if his minutes restriction is lifted and like you have Larry playing small ball five too. like the Cavs have versatility in their front court. It's just hard. It's, it's a tough choice, but maybe it's more situational. It's more matchup. Let's say like they're playing Philadelphia and they have to handle Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. And I think Philadelphia is still remaining on their schedule, at least in late May, April, early, early May. I could be wrong on that one. No, they're done for the year. Never mind. So, yep. um, I was wrong on that, but let's say theoretic, theoretically they're playing Philadelphia again. And you have to deal with Joel Embiid. That Hartenstein makes more sense in those scenarios or a team that maybe like if they played New Orleans again for some reason, like Hartenstein makes sense there because you have to deal with Steven Adams and Zion Williams. And like you maybe just need a body to kind of slow down a bulky front court rotation like that. But it, it's an interesting thought process. Who'd you pick? I go Dean Wade be just because of the shooting, because I think you need to maximize your shooting. Like this team just needs spacing. Like Okora was not a spacer. Like, uh, Larry, you know, is a reluctant three point shooter and teams don't really come out on him as, as a shooter very much like Jared Allen's you, not going to draw defenders away. Do you think Larry being a reluctant shooter is more of a risk thing? Or do you think he's just more focused on being a team player and trying to keep the rest of his teammates involved? I learned the, I, I think the latter because it, it's why it's your wiring, right? Like D- yeah. Darius Garland's wiring as a player might be just to pass a little bit more. And like, you got to like rework some of your habits and things. And Larry, like this is the first, this is the second year, but really the first like full year where he's taking like a decent chunk of threes. Like it's the first year it's really been like a, a significant part of his offensive output. It's not just like a little dabbling, right? Like it, this is the year where it's sort of come out in the scene with him. And, you know, I, it's, it's an adjustment process. I, I also look at the schedule and it's like, okay, Charlotte doesn't have like a center that I'm particularly like, I feel like I need heart and science, massive body to maybe like Cody Zeller, just like Rex in the pick and roll for, for one game or something. And you have to adjust, but who's starting you know, Golden... for Charlotte these days. This is, this is my probably Zeller? recording this on a Monday. I, I think it's Zeller. Is it, I mean, PJ Washington plays for the five at the five for them, right? Is- yeah, a little bit, but but my my point is like he's like a small, and then you get to Golden State, like they just lost Wiseman, like they don't have like a guy you're gonna do that stuff with necessarily. Like Chicago has Vooch and uh, and Daniel Tice, so it's like those are a little bit smaller, more mobile centers. Like you know maybe Isaiah Stewart, aka Beef Stew, which is a great nickname. Uh, maybe you want to like go big there, but Hardstein's also like earned. Th- like he's also been good enough where I think you want to maybe give him some minutes. That so this is like a question for JB, I think of how to disperse that. The passing point in all of this is really interesting because, like, I I want to see Jared Allen try to do that stuff. Mm-hmm. It is the one thing that Hartenstein has like done. I think better than Allen at all is is passing guys from the top of the key and kind of adding a little bit of playmaking stuff. Allen is more prone in that spot on the floor to take like a little floater to take that little. Um, jumper from the free throw line area that he's very comfortable with. But if you put him at the nail, you put him in certain spots where Hardenstein is throwing passes and doing DHOs. Like that's something that they want Allen to do. And I, I think you got to force feed him reps in that sense and, and make him comfortable in that way. I'm, I'm more, much more invested in that than I am. You know, I, I think Harden, I think Allen's clearly just much more part of the future than Hardenstein yeah. is even though Hardenstein has been a lot of fun since he's come over in the McGee trade. Well, I feel like Hardstein will be part of the future plans. He's still young, and he's on a relatively well, cheap contract. Well, I don't think it's like a play, future it, future it, plans, but he's an option at least. I mean, he's a, it's a play, he's got a player option, and that will be very interesting to, to monitor what mm-hmm. he does with that. I don't or think they he bring, opts like, out because I think this is an opportunity for minutes. Like he wasn't playing in Denver at all, and he played 
at random in Houston, mostly the Rio Grande Valley Vipers, Kevin, Kevin Porter Jr.'s team of choice. But <laughs> I don't know. It's 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 an interesting thought exercise, and I guess Golden State would make more sense to throw Hartenstein in there because James Wiseman is a traditional center through and through. But like Charlotte, you said it's interesting. Well, because... Wiseman's, that Wiseman's out with them. The yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, so Hartenstein just kind of comes like, eh, maybe you just want to kind of try and match Golden State for shot for shot because Golden State's still a lethal three point shooting team. I mean, Steph Curry just alone is a nuclear option. Andrew Wiggins has a propensity to kill the Cavs because he. Oh, man, the Cavs did him dirty during um his the his rookie year. Didn't sign a contract with play for Cleveland during summer league just because he knew he was going to be traded and he was sitting in limbo because of the Kevin Love trade situation because they did sign him to a contract and they extend the whole thing as well. It's just that was a mess. But Andrew Wiggins has an, a thing for killing the Cavs, especially in Cleveland. So I don't know. Hardenstein becomes a little useless against Golden State. You said Charlotte's an interesting scenario because they do have Biombo. They do have Zeller. I mean, they could go smaller with Washington and try and keep up with Cleveland shot for shot and kind of like, I don't know, counter balance some of the JB's propensity to go big. But I don't know. It's these two matchups aren't really a good indicator. Say like if this is a good Hardenstein moment. And I just think, yeah, Dean Wade, just because of the three point shooting and maybe just the he doesn't foul as much like you can rely on him a bit more i think i'd rather lean him at least for these upcoming matchups and probably down the line as well yeah two things to note here just about charlotte and golden state obviously you mentioned the meniscus thing for golden state um the thing i'll watch on what for for that game is just i want to see okoro on guarding steph curry like he might get torched a lot he probably will curry's incredible but i love watching okoro defend guards it's just a lot of fun and uh that's that's what i want to watch that's like where my eyes will be for that game and then mm-hmm. secondly, uh, Charlotte is going to be without LaMelo Ball and Gordon Hayward. And yes, they're, they're playing frisky. Like they just, you know, gave Atlanta a real game. And and like they're not like certainly by any stretch of imagination, like falling off of a cliff or anything like that. Like their numbers, you know, the last couple of weeks have not like fallen off a cliff. They haven't become just suddenly like a really bad team, even though you they've lost like the two engines of their offense. Like Borrego's a good coach and, and all of that stuff. But like you, I think you look at um, that game and it's like that. These are winnable games. Like I think we'll we'll talk about this in the last segment as kind of the focus of the standings here. But like the Cavs have a bunch of winnable games this month. They're obviously a little behind the eight. Not they're it's behind the eight ball. Like there is means you have yeah, like they're not behind the eight ball. They're not behind no. the eight ball. No, they're not behind so, the eight ball. They're, yeah. they're struggling to get back in yeah. the footing here and everything. Yeah, so Charlotte um, in the last two weeks is like a little below average in offense and defense, like, but they're still solid and tough, and they'll be interesting. This is a good slate of games. Good, I think good thing good for Cleveland to get a couple days off before they play them. But, Evan, we got some more bills to pay, and I'm going to tell everyone about our friends at Bill Bar. Bill Bar, obviously, is the best-tasting protein bar Onto the market, they have a bunch of new flavors, including caramel brownie, cookies and cream, cherry, barcia, and a whole bunch more. Some of the great original flavors include coconut, almond, raspberry, German chocolate, and mint brownie. Bill bars are healthy. They are great for the health conscious guy. They can help you lose or maintain weight while indulging in a delicious treat. They are low calorie, low sugar, high protein, high fiber, great for a keto diet. Right now, you can get a free cooler with purchase that is while supplies last and go to BillBar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. Again, that's LOCKED15 to get 50% off your next order. That's LOCKED15 at BillBar.com. Again, check them out. And if they happen to have the cookie dough chunk or the coconut brownie chunk bars, order them. Use that promo code LOCKED15 and I promise you won't regret it. Evan, uh, uh-huh. I want you to tell everyone about our friends at Online. Uh, bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Football might be over, but the NBA and the NHL are in full swing. Bet online even covers awards, TV shows, and reality TV. They have real time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. Bet online has you covered for all the news, scores, and odds. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. So head over to their website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit, but only if you use the promo code Locked On. Again, you will get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit, but only if you use that promo code locked on. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts and the exclusive betting partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Get more analysis on the top prospects available in this year's NBA draft, the Locked On NBA Draft Podcast. Scouting reports, draft rumors, and so much more four days a week with from credential draft experts follow the locked on nba draft podcast on the odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts probably the same place you find locked on calves all right evan let's talk about the schedule let's talk about the plane hunt versus the draft standings um 
The so, silly hand rigging. Should I pull up Tankathon while you talk? Share yeah, some, you'll do it. Some... We'll, we'll, you'll do us. This will be our new bit it. while you while you rant. I'll just quietly. Okay, ready. Do just do a spin and tell us what our, our draft are, and I'll name my prospect. Detroit at two. Minute, just give me. Just tell me where five. the Cavs are picking, Evan. Just tell me where the Cavs six. are picking. Six. Okay. Moses Moody. Does someone slip? Does Kuminga slip to six? Well, it options? could it could be Scotty Friends Barnes. Scotty Barnes. Barnes. Jalen Johnson. Corey. Not Corey Kisper. Definitely not. Um. You got options. Yeah. Keon, Keon Johnson. Moses. It's not the end of the world, but it's just another single. Let's do this again. Two. Evan Mobley for sure. Great name. Get oh, replace I might go that to... USC four. I, Would I you might really go uh, Suggs at two? No, I might go Jalen two? Green at two. Yeah, I might. Hey, Give me the wings. I, I, I have you know my tendencies, Evan. I know that you want a guy with your name, but like I have I have my tendencies. But here's where we're at with this. So here's I'm gonna list off the the, the teams Cleveland plays the rest of April. Charlotte, Golden State, Chicago, Detroit, who sucks. Chicago again, Charlotte, Washington, Toronto, Orlando, who sucks. The Wizards, who have Bradley Beal, but otherwise are kind of bleh. Like, that is the rest of April. That's a pretty easy slate for, for the rest of the month. The Cavs are in this position where they are, um, in, I think, like, what, had the, fifth, or the fifth, wor- fifth worst team in the league at the current moment, correct? I think somewhere like that, mm-hmm. according to the Tankathon. Yeah, they have the fifth worst record in the league and the third worst record in the Eastern Conference. They're a half game back of Washington for the 12th worst record in the Eastern conference. And they are one and a half games back of Toronto slash Tampa, whatever you want to call them for the 11th seed. So to, but to get to, and uh, I think the plane is to 10. Yeah, it's to 10 and that's Chicago. And they're, so they're three, three and a half back of them. Three and a half back. And then like so the seven is the cap for the play in and Cleveland is eight and a half back of yeah, uh, I Boston for look, that. They're making they making a run for that is like I think out of the question. That's that would just be nuts. But yeah, it, I would say it's fake. <laughs> Kill me. But the the Cavs are like literally in the middle of the worst record in the East. Like they're three and a half above Detroit on, on as of Monday, and they're three and a half behind Chicago. They're literally smack dad in the middle of these two realities. Two people that's just like fun. That. That's a funny place to be. It is. Uh, reality is often disappointing, as a wise philosopher once said. But the Cavs definitely are not going to catch up with Detroit for the worst record in the in the East, again. at least. Uh, but in Western Conference side of things, like it's even more dire. Like Minnesota, I called this by the way. Minnesota is going to be the worst team in the league. Um, they're fourteen and forty. Cleveland's not catching up to them. And then Houston obviously didn't see that coming until Harden showed up overweight and won it out. But um, they're fourteen and thirty nine. So those two are going to be jockeying for like the worst record overall. Then it's going to be Detroit, and then Orlando, then probably Cleveland. But like you said, Cleveland could easily jump up to three if things go sideways between now and May when things get a lot worse. Yeah, and I think that's my point. Like, I don't think just the way the draft odds work, like, there is any particular harm in, like, trying to be competitive. I think you want to get those reps. Um, I sort of just am of the opinion, and, I, I like, you're obviously not going to get, like, a public answer about this, but I bet you, like, the, the top brass of the team, like, looks at the May schedule and is like, okay, like, this will sort of just take care of itself because um, yeah. it's just absolutely brutal. Like, the, the schedule for Cleveland in, in May includes, like, Miami. It includes... Uh, Portland, like Phoenix, Brooklyn, North the end, twice, like in, Brooklyn, Boston, Indiana. I think I have their May schedule memorized at this point. I think it, it, is, it is like a bunch. It, of, it, it's, it, it's it is tough. like a bunch of teams. It's a bunch of teams that are like playing for something, you know. And, and um, they're also most of those are on the road, which Cleveland is not very good this year. So, Evan, if you had to say, like, like I think the likeliest scenario here is they sort of just remain like in this middle ground, ultimately. Yeah, but like if you're if you're saying like one of the, if they're either gonna what is more likely to do bottoming out or actually making like the the race for the ten seed like a competitive thing into into May like which one of those is more likely in your mind? Um, I think they're gonna the try, I think they're gonna remain feisty, but I don't think they're gonna be still winning a lot. Like I think I thought they were gonna kind of beat up Toronto a little bit. I just you kind of we talked about this like there's not a lot you can do, and Gary Trent Jr. is just so dialed in like that the second quarter, and it's just <laughs> literally like, has the most efficient forty point game in Raptors franchise history. Yeah, I mean like like hey, I'm not gonna say it loud like because it's gonna play, but like hey Siri, play landslide by Fleetwood Mac real quick for me, or the is that the dicks? Is that dick? Is that the chicks? But either way, um. It was pretty rough for the Cavs then. Like I thought they were going to beat Toronto slash Tampa, but 
is what it is and you move on from there and i think that's also just a sobering reality the fact that like yeah the Cavs do have a pretty easy schedule for the better part of april and then it gets tougher back in may but i don't think anything's a guaranteed win because you talk you and i talked about this this is a young and inexperienced team i think they're gonna be feisty i think they're gonna be scrappy i think they'll be in a lot of these games but i also wouldn't be shocked if like they the Cavs have a few just like kind of like oh man that stinks losses but like in the big picture not too upset with every loss because let's say the Cavs do jockey their way back up to third. Um, They're in familiar territory, but the sixth pick is their best odd. Like this, the fifth, the variance with having the fifth horse record is wild. So like right now the Cavs have a 26.7% chance of getting the seventh pick and then 10.5% chance for the first, second or fourth pick, a 10.6% chance for the third pick, a 19.6% chance for the sixth pick. And then it just kind of jumps around there until you get up to a hundred at that point. But, um, the fifth slot is a li- makes gives me the sweats a little bit. Um, I think I, if the Cavs were trying to incentivize themselves, I think sitting like at three four range isn't a bad thing. But I just don't think they're gonna. I think they're better than Detroit, and I think Detroit's like, or oh, Detroit focused. stinks. Detroit stinks, and they're focusing on the future at this point. Like, there's no jokes about it. And like, Orlando is kind of offloading everything either but like i don't know i think the Cavs are going to be like an honest team at least at least some of these teams are trying to tank even though tanking is de-incentivized at this point but it's not going to be like houston or minnesota or some of these other or i should say the the seattle timberwolves at some point i'm just going to speak into the existence so i something oh, to complain buddy. about but um oh, buddy. I, I i think the Cavs are going to remain competitive I, I i that's all i want like colin told me when i interviewed him back for that story closer to the beginning of 2021 um he's sick of losing and i think that's pretty much a sentiment like if you ask larry that if you ask kevin that if you ask any player on this roster maybe not jared allen because yeah, they, they've been they, here that no, long like, they, they're they don't, well, well none losing. of these guys none of these guys like care like the the, the unspoken reality of, of all this when we talk about team building i'll say this very briefly is just players don't care about like the next draft pick because that could be no. a guy coming to take their job, take money out of their, you know what I mean? Like that's just the reality of it. And yes, like there is ultimately camaraderie. And well, like, it also affects their next paycheck too. Right. So it's just one of the things, but here, here's what I'll just say as we wrap up here, the two games that I think will be the most impactful on this discussion are the Chicago games. So they play Chicago yeah. on Saturday in Chicago, and then they play the men home on April 21st. Cleveland has obviously beat them in the one matchup this year. They beat them 103 to 94 on March 24th. Garland had 22. Dance had 14 boards. Garland had uh, six, nine assists in that game. Cleveland won that game uh, at, at that point, and then you know went on went on a losing streak out west um, after that before their recent wins against San Antonio and Oklahoma City. So that that like th- that five game losing streak that followed that Bulls win really isn't that far away, even though the vibes yeah. are like a little better right now. That's just the reality of like, you know, just next game, next game, next game. But those two games, if you want to make a real run uh, at that, you need to, I think, pick up probably one of them and probably both of them if you want a real run at the at the 10th spot. Like, those are going to be two very pivotal games with stakes, with, with weight to them if you're Cleveland and you're trying to make up ground and get a tiebreaker if it comes down to that. If you want to give yourself every advantage you can, it's the Bulls games that take place on Saturday and then next Wednesday. Evan, let's yeah. get out of here. Um, yep. Find us on lo- at Locked on Cavs on Twitter. You can find our socials if you're watching a video below. I'm at CWM Rights, and you're at Am and not Evan. Um, I don't think you have them, but we will be doing iTunes review shout-outs for the Thursday show. Evan, I'm putting you on video now. Are you going to be ready for that? I'll be ready for the Thursday show because we're recording this on Monday and it's been a long day for ya boy, but I'll be ready and prepared. I'll have them typed out nicely and neatly in our reviews for the back-to-backs when we talk about them. So please go to Apple Podcasts if you haven't already and take care of that. Again, Cleveland is in action on Thursday, in action on Wednesday. We'll have all of that and more. We'll be on Locker Room as well on Wednesday at 1230 for our lunchtime with Locked on Cavs chat for myself, for Evan, this has been Lockdown Cavs. Thanks for tuning in on WKYC or wherever you listen to podcasts. 